Good afternoon, everyone. It is Sunday, March the 14th, 2021. It is currently 3.26 p.m. Central Time. And once again, I'm here at Victory Baptist Church. I'm inside the empty sanctuary. I'm here at the back table. I have all of my podcasting equipment set up. And it has been a crazy day. I don't know if you've been listening to us today, but Sunday school and the Sunday morning sermon all dealt with this crazy controversy over the idea that empathy is a sin. And I guess everyone in the church has gotten it wrong for, I don't know, it seems forever. I mean, I've been a Christian for a long time, and I guess we've all gotten it wrong forever. A crazy controversy, really frustrating. And in fact, by the time I left church, as I was driving back home after those two hours of trying to deal with the controversy, I felt... I felt feelings of discouragement, right? I mean, I felt like really I had to come to church and spend two hours dealing with a controversy about empathy being a sin. I mean, I I never would have imagined when I thought about becoming a pastor that one day I would have to stand behind the pulpit and say, look, everyone, now within Christianity, there's people telling you that empathy is a sin. And if you don't believe that, it's basically because you're dumb and you can't understand things. And you just need to have a better understanding. It, it, and that if I'm a pastor and, and I don't believe that empathy is sin, I, I'm not really a, a very good pastor and I'm not worth my salt and all of the other accusations. I, I would have never believed that that's where I would end up. But here I am in 2021 dealing with this crazy, insane controversy. And it's, it's really frustrating. And it just shows you, um, or I, I guess it's, It's just another piece of evidence demonstrating what is going on inside the Christian church. The Christian church is in in grave danger. I'm telling you, Christianity is slowly but surely being written out of existence into looking into, it's being written out of existence as far as looking like anything like historical biblical Christianity. We've talked about the, the, Political hijacking of the church, whether you want to talk left or you want to talk right. You can talk about the woke church, the progressive church. You can talk about the the Christian nationalism all the way to the— I mean, it doesn't matter. There's so many things attacking the church and trying to redefine what Christianity is that it's, it's very frustrating. It's very discouraging. And yet here I am to talk about another threat to the church. Um, this one I heard um, on the way— here. As I got in my car this afternoon, I had to stop and put gas in the car, which have you seen the gas prices lately? Yeah, I'm going to have to start taking love offerings just to pay for my trip here. But okay, that's, I'm, I'm joking. You know, I don't do that. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it, yeah, that's crazy. But as I got into the, as I, uh, as I put gas in the car and got on the highway and started driving here, um, a program came on, a program that I don't always understand. It's very much a, 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 a not, a, I state that again. Not a program that I don't always understand, a program that I don't always agree with. Uh, the reason I, I use the word understand is the program is called Understanding the Times. So um, that's why I was already jumping ahead in my mind. So that's how I messed that up. So just so that you understand that my m- mistake had a reason. A program I don't always agree with, especially as it comes to sometimes its views on eschatology and the end times. However, I found the conversation they were having to be very interesting, and I thought it would be very beneficial for us to take some time this afternoon to sit back and listen to it, because it's talking about some things that they believe have now entered into the Christian church that, once again, is trying to redefine Christianity. We've got the political hijacking, where I have spent a lot of time warning. They are warning that what has crept into the church is basically New Age mysticism, or things of the New Age movement, and the occult has literally come inside the Christian church. Now, that's their claim. Well, listen to their claims. You can see whether you agree or disagree. You can can do your own research, but we, we will consider what they have to say, not so much as I'm not really going to approach this as whether I agree or disagree. I'm going to approach it more to say, here's, here's what they are presenting. Everyone listening should do their own research to see, because look, I, like I, my focus has been on the political hijacking. But if coming through the front door or the back door 
is the occult and new age mysticism has crept into the church, then obviously we need to be aware of that as well. I, I think the time is coming that I, I hate to say it, that if you're a Christian, you're, it's just, you're not going to feel welcomed inside the church. I, I think that's where we are. And so I, let's start with a very important passage of scripture. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. I know this morning, uh, for Sunday school and the Sunday morning, morning worship service, we were in Second Timothy, uh, which was a, a very important passage for that conversation. But let's look at this one. First Timothy chapter four, verse one. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. That's that would be those within Christianity shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. And doctrines of devils. Now, as I have said before, I believe some of the passages in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy that people quote to go, hey, this is a this is a picture of the last days, and they sometimes apply it to what's going on in the world. I think once again, this is a passage clearly speaking of what's coming to the church. Inside the church, there are going to be those inside the church who depart from the faith, but I believe they're going to remain in the church. They've departed from the faith. In other words, from the true historical biblical Christianity, but I believe they're going to remain in the church and what they're going to bring in the church is they're going to give heed to seducing spirits, bringing those seducing spirits into the church and doctrines of devils are going to be preached from the pulpit. I think that's something that we have to be on the lookout for. So let's listen to uh, this. Again, the name of the program is Understanding the Times. I would highly recommend you subscribe to their podcast, Understanding the Times. I don't always agree with everything. There's sometimes I'm like, oh, wait, what? Um, Make sure you understand their eschatology. They come from a very um, typical dispensational view, pre-trib, uh, a rapture kind of idea. Um, if you don't agree with that form of eschatology, I'm not here to get into an argument with you about eschatology. What I want to do is, it, even though they have their view of eschatology in place, they do talk about a lot of things happening sometimes within the church. And I think that no matter what your view in eschatology is, I think that aspect of the discussion is very worthwhile and can be a warning for you to look around and go, is this happening in Christianity and what should we do about it? And how can we prepare our people to stand against it and to identify it? So are you ready for this Sunday afternoon? Let's listen to this this weekend's episode of Understanding the Times. It's airing on Christian Radio. It aired on uh, Christian Radio yesterday and today. Um, it's available online. Again, Understanding the Times. I'm going to let them play all of their commercials, all of their ads promoting their ministry so that you can hear the things they are offering. If you want to look it up, if you want to subscribe, if you want to uh, buy any of their products, I will let them apply all of that out since we're using their program as an episode here, even though we're reviewing it, I still want them to be able to promote what they want to promote. So we will leave that in. So are you ready? Thinking caps on, you may want to grab a Bible, a notebook, and let's consider this question. Has the, has the new age movement and the occult found its way into the church? And if so, can you identify it? And what should we do? Here we go. The Antichrist will be a man skilled in the supernatural and paranormal. Is the stage being set? Yes, you read the headline correct. You can now get Christ Alignment readings online. And they look at this as good news. Well, I think some of us would disagree. This is online witchcraft disguised as some kind of New Age Christianity. Welcome to Understanding the Times Radio with Jan Markell. Radio for the Remnant. Brought to you by Olive Tree Ministries. Today, Jan visits with author Ryan Peterson about the rise of the occult, New Age, paranormal, and more. And their invasion into the world and the church. Why are believers being fooled and seduced by the demonic? And why aren't our churches preparing the saints for this battle? Here is today's programming. What we're going to see tonight is just a smattering, just give you a little teaser of where we're going to head. Just a big overshot. Then we're going to get into individual studies and go down super deep and get educated in the occult, the dark arts. And it is on the rise, not just in the world, It's on the rise in the church. It's being popularized by Hollywood just in time for people to think, I don't need God, no need to repent. I can do whatever I want to do. Don't tell me what to do. 
and they're going to get involved in the dark arts, magic, sorcery, witchcraft, Satanism, and that's the culture God said is going to be in the seven-year tribulation. And I don't think many people in the church even realize how far the occult has progressed, again, not just in the world, but in the church. Welcome to Understanding the Times Radio. I hope that was a sufficient tease. That was Pastor Billy Crone. He's not my guest. I'm going to say more about his online series on the alcohol as I move into the program because I'm going to play a few clips from his teachings on this. But I do have a special guest with me, and I'm going to bring him on in just a moment. I'd like to set the stage first to sort of compliment what Pastor Crone just said. This growing fascination of the occult, of the supernatural, of the New Age movement, sorcery, pharmacia, or drug-related sorcery. We've got familiar spirits. Honestly, what it says in 2 Timothy 3 probably sums it up. Maybe we don't need to go any further. Even with an introduction in the last days, evil is going to wax worse and worse. But my concern, and we'll talk about general rising sorcery, etc., We're going to focus, at least for the first part of the program, on how it's creeping into the church. My goodness, we're going to look at a little bit of Christ alignment. We'll spend a few minutes on the Enneagram. Of course, I have a theory presented on this program many times, and I believe that a modern-day trigger for all of this was, of course, the Harry Potter series that blossomed now 20 years ago. And that made evil look good. It intrigued children who wanted to be like Harry. And so some of those children turned into teens and now young adults who are now pursuing the dark arts. But evil- Now, let me stop right here. You know that I, <laughs> I sometimes have to shake my head at the church and Christians with the way they react to certain things within popular culture. The Harry Potter books were extremely successful, obviously a worldwide phenomenon. The movies were extremely successful. And Christians, and not all Christians, but many Christians ran ran around, you know, ban the books. Don't let the books be in the the school library. My kid's not going to read that book. Burn the books. Just, Just craziness. And we never bothered to sit down to explain to children how to process and analyze art. Look, there are all, look, there's books, there's movies of all kinds that your children are going to be exposed to. It's one thing just say, that's a bad movie, don't look at it. That's a bad book, don't read it. That's a bad this. You've also got to teach your kids how to see and hear things that go against a Christian worldview and that they can process it. Okay, here's the story arc. Here's what the story is about. Okay, is, they are utilizing this idea of wizardry and magic, and they're using this within the story. Uh, what, is a, uh, what does the Christian worldview say in regards to these things? That you can process it. It's not just bad. And I, I, I am still skeptical. I'm still skeptical. And, and, and maybe, and I know that there have been certain reports about it that, hey, that, that you've got a whole generation of kids out there trying to become a witch and becoming all of these things because of Harry Potter. I'm still skeptical. How many people grow up and like, you know what? I'm going to pursue a, a study of the dark arts and the occult and, and magic because when I was a kid, I watched a, a, a movie or I read a book series or watched a, a movie series uh, with uh, that had magic in it, that had wizardry in it. And so now I'm going to pursue, I, I just, I mean, how many kids have been exposed throughout history of, of stories of mythology, of magic, of dragons, of of witches, of warlocks. Uh, I mean, you, you there. I mean, that kind of stuff shows up in so many different kinds of books and stories, over and over and over. The bad witch, good witch, good magic, bad magic. Do this, cast a spell, throw on a curse. I mean, th- that stuff is is throughout literature and movies. And I, and I just, it just seems weird that Harry Potter was like that's. That's why the reason it's coming to the church is because this generation was raised with Harry Potter. I, I don't, maybe a generation was raised not knowing how to process uh, art and how to actually, you know, hey, we don't have to, just because it's in a movie doesn't mean you run out and have to do everything that's in it, like process it. But, but could it be that maybe part of the reason some of these things have crept into the church has nothing to do with Harry Potter has to do that the church did not equip the saints and and protect them from being tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine by 
giving them a good understanding of doctrine, theology, how to engage culture, how to process things, how to think, how to maybe maybe there's a diff, uh, a different issue, but she she puts some of the blame on Harry Potter. You can have look, you can have your own discussions. Uh, look, everyone gets upset with me about how I handled it. I handled it very simple. I didn't encourage my kids to read the books because the books were gigantic. My kids were not big readers, and I knew that they started trying to read those books that would spend all of their life reading their books and not reading other things that they needed to read. So I didn't discourage, but I didn't encourage. But when the movies came out, we watched, I think, I I said, you want to go see the movies? Everybody was talking about it. I think we watched the first two movies. Uh, We talked about what was in the movies, what was this, what was that, the story arc, a friendship, uh, you know, all the different things going on, the magic. What does the Bible say about magic? We just kind of, I mean, because that's what we do with everything, our rule in our house. If you can't explain to me the meaning and the message of the show, then you shouldn't be watching anything. Uh, Whatever we watched, we talked, and they had to be able to explain to me the meaning, the message, what was going on. They had to be able to articulate it, analyze it. And, and, we didn't make a big deal out of it. By the end of the second movie, my kids could care less. They they moved on. They didn't care about Harry Potter. They didn't care because we didn't make it this like big forbidden taboo that they, they were like, oh no, I, I can't watch that. Okay, I wonder what's in that. We just didn't make it a big deal. We sat down, we watched it, we discussed it. Next, and everybody moved on. So not everyone agrees with my approach. You may have your approach. I'm not here to get into that to, to that debate. I'm just saying that, It's easy to put, it's always easy to take something in the world. Let me, let me, let me, let me at least approach it this perspective. Let me throw out kind of a principle. I think within Christianity, we always find it very easy to blame the problems in the church on something the world did. The reason we have these problems in the church is because the people out there in the world, they did this, or they made this movie, or that video game, or and and I think sometimes we don't put the blame, well, on the church itself. Now, she may be more dealing with the fact of the spread of the occult mysticism within the world, and not necessarily blaming Harry Potter for it in the church, but she clearly made it, she clear, in, the, in her introduction so far, she's made it very clear she's focusing in on how it's creeping into the church, and then she mentions Harry Potter, and she puts some blame there. So, uh, yeah. I, I, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll back it up a little bit so you can hear that and then we'll move forward. Here we go. I'm going to, um, it's going to take me a second to back this up. So let me go back here. There we go. Here we go. Good. It intrigued children who wanted to be like Harry. And so some of those children turned into teens and now young adults who are now pursuing the dark arts. But in the church, the growth of the occult and the paranormal in the church Well, I am going back to the new Terry James book, Lawless, the End Times War Against the Spirit of Antichrist. And of course, I contributed to this book, as did 16 other authors. And then I came to a chapter by my guest, Ryan Peterson. It's titled End Times Embrace of Evil. He looks at the overall rise of the paranormal. My interest again And we're going to talk about it in general, but we're going to start with how it is mushrooming in the church, because that troubles me more than just about anything. Obviously, we want to also talk about how we can be a light in this darkness. We're not just going to sit here and talk about the dark hearts, but you need to protect your loved ones from some of these things that are going on, bombarding everybody daily. What we speak about, it's growing in a staggering way, and it's going to blossom fully in the tribulation from which the church is absent. So what we're seeing is clearly a run-up, a setting the stage for the tribulation. So Ryan Peterson, welcome to Understanding the Times Radio. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be on. I enjoy your work, and we're going to say more about that as we move into the programming. But look, you say in your chapter, you refer to a Pew Research Survey that six in ten Christians, six in ten Christians hold to at least one central New Age belief. Now, I want you to hear that. According to Pew Research, six out of ten Christians hold to some central New Age belief. Now, I'm telling you, that didn't happen because of Harry Potter. That didn't happen because of anything in the world. That happened because the church has not 
given people a clear doctrinal theological understanding of life, themselves, the world around them. We've abandoned historical creeds. We've abandoned confessions of faith. We've abandoned catechesis and really, really teaching doctrine and theology, even at a young age. So much of so much of a, a young person's church experience from the youth are all the way from a toddler all the way up to the youth group before they leave high school. So much of it is centered around fun and activity and and moralism. It's moralism. Don't drink. Don't do drugs. Don't have sex. You know, and, and, and it's all about it's it's so horribly weak when it comes to doctrine, theology, and church history. You find young people who cannot even articulate the basic tenets of Christianity. Young people who don't even know the history of their faith. They don't know anything about the, the, the first seven ecumenical councils. They don't know anything about the church fathers. They Many of them don't even know. If you say Martin Luther, they think you, you're referring to Martin Luther, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., not Martin Luther the Reformer. They don't even know what happened in the Protestant Reformation. They can't articulate some of the basic questions and, and historical catechisms. They, they, they can't really articulate the doctrine of justification, imputation, pro, uh, you know, uh, we, could go, we could go on and on, propitiation, we could go on and on and on. They just don't know because the youth group is a joke. Youth ministry is a joke. You want to find youth directors that are hip and cool and I guess can relate to the kids more than youth directors who are really knowledgeable of doctrine and theology teaching the kids doctrine and theology. Again, I've stated it before. When I first got the opportunity to be in charge of a youth group, it was like verse by verse through the book of Leviticus. We're not going to talk about the evils of rock and roll. We're not going to talk about the evils of dancing. And we're not going to talk about kissing, dating goodbye. We're going to talk about the Bible, the scriptures, you know, what we're supposed to be. You're, you're supposed to be equipped for the work of ministry. So I'm going to treat you like you have a brain and let's open your Bibles, grab a notebook and let's dig in. And so um, that's that's the way it should be done, but it, it's not. So I, I think the church, again, the church is to be blamed for this. So let's back this up again. Again, that's a crazy statistic. I'll back this up just a little bit, uh, a little bit here. All right, here we go. Research survey that six in 10 Christians, six in 10 Christians hold to at least one central New Age belief. Now, you ask, how could so many people who identify as born-again Christians hold beliefs so out of line with basic biblical Christianity? You ask that question. I don't know if that was rhetorical. Do you have an answer? Yes, I do have an answer. I was asking the question rhetorically, and still part of me is still begging the Lord to know how could this happen. As you said, this is written in prophecy. First Timothy chapter 4, we are told, the Spirit speaketh expressly, then the latter times some shall depart from the faith. So we're talking about those who are in the church, giving heed to seducing spirits yes. and doctrines of devils. And that's what we're seeing. I, see, I, I, I don't like his answer. Yes, I do believe that this is pro prophesied, but everyone, every pastor who's ever pastored a church knows that prophecy. So he should be preparing the people for the inevitable coming, falling away, and apostasy that's coming to the church. He should pre be preparing and fighting against it. You can't just blame it. Well, it's prophesied. How about blame the church for not doing its job? Why can they hold beliefs that are completely contrary to the basic beliefs of Christianity? Because they don't know the basic beliefs of Christianity. They can't even articulate it. They don't know doctrine. They don't know theology. You start giving them a, a basic th theology test, they, they'll, they'll fail. Why? Because the church has become a joke. It's not a place to equip saints. It's a place to entertain them. It's a place to, to just give the people what they want when they want it. There, there, it's just, I mean, I've been preaching, I've been yelling about this for literally my whole Christian life. I got sick of it as a Christian teenager. The church was a joke. You weren't teaching me anything. You wanted to take me to Six Flags. You wanted to play a lot, do, you know, have a lock-in. You wanted to play capture the flag. You wanted pizza parties. I wanted to learn doctrine and, and study the Bible. So what did I do? Forget the youth group. I got in my car, drove to the uh, Bible bookstore, Thank God there was an older gentleman there who handed me the Foundations of the Christian Faith by James Montgomery Boyce and said, this is what you need. He didn't treat me as a teenager. He didn't take me over to the youth section and say, here's some hip Christian book. No, he gave me a, a very in-depth teaching of Christian theology. That's what he gave a teenager. 
Praise God for that older gentleman. And I got to meet that man many years later and at least thank him for what he did because I'll, that had a profound impact on my, on my life. In fact, I can see the book that I purchased that day uh, sitting up at the front behind the pulpit on a table behind the pulpit uh, right here in the church. Um, that I still own the book. That's how profound of impact it had on me. And I realized that, okay, Christianity, there's doctrine, there's history, there's theology. And and no, so we don't do that. And then we're like, I I just can't fit. Oh, okay, it's prophecy. That's why it's happening. That's why it's happening. Yeah. No. Yes, it is prophecy. But the church knew it was coming. So why were we not fighting against it and preparing our people for it? So we're seeing that once we have the leadership. When we're talking about doctrine, we're talking about teaching. So once we see the teaching embracing concepts that are not only just unbiblical, but new age and even a cult, you're going to have the congregation start being deceived and moving us closer to the strong delusion that will come in the Great Tribulation. You are blunt in your chapter, and I appreciated that. And you referenced, and let's talk about it here for a few minutes, because we're going to talk about Christ alignment. You even reference Bethel Church, Redding, California, and you suggest that they are. Now stop right here. This is very important. In a book talking about the new age and the occult coming into the church, the the first church that's mentioned in this program is Bethel Church in Redding, California. Now, if you've been listening, I've been telling you to listen to a podcast called Heaven Bent, where this season they are talking about Bethel Church in Redding, California. I think it's fascinating that Bethel Church is being mentioned here because Bethel Church is considered one of the most influential churches in the United States of America. And here we have a program saying that church is partially responsible for for bringing in some of these new age occult type practices. So listen carefully to this. Now, Bethel denies this. Bethel has a statement on their website denying some of this, but listen to this carefully. This is, uh, this is very important. I want you to do your own research on this. Let's listen to this because, again, there, we're dealing with an influential church in the United States of America. I'm going to back this up just a few seconds. Here we go. All right, here we go. Church, Redding, California, and you suggest that they are engaging in the doctrine of demons, and you go into some of the aberrant things going on there, but their embrace of Christ alignment. And I do want to read a paragraph off their website because they are really saying, hey, we don't practice Christ alignment, but we're supportive of what's happening, particularly in Australia. I'll read that in just a moment. But talk to me for just a moment about Christ alignment. I'm going to play a clip about Christ alignment. If we were to put it in everyday terms, it's Christian tarot cards. And yes, whoever thought we'd be sitting here talking about Christian tarot cards. Exactly. And that's really what it is. So they refer to them as destiny cards. Yes. But at the end of the day, what these cards are used for, they're cards with images on them and symbols that are used to give someone a reading about their future, which clearly from Scripture, Deuteronomy 18, this mm-hmm. is divination. You are divining someone's future. That is clearly forbidden and an abomination to God. And I've seen their statements to say that these aren't tarot cards, and technically they're not, but they're using them in the exact same way. And for all right, we got to stop right here. Okay, this Christ alignment. Now, I would, I, I want you to write this down, Christ alignment, and I want you to do um, a little bit of your own research here because this is crazy. This, this, this is just, I can't even believe that this would even ever enter into the church. It's, it, it is basic Christian, tar- Christian tarot cards, which is just kind of like, what, what is going on? What is going on? And so I'm going to give you a website uh, to uh, to look up, all right? It's ChristAlignment.org. ChristAlignment, all run together. ChristAlignment.org. ChristAlignment.org. Alignment is spelled, obviously, A-L-I-G-N-M-E-N-T. ChristAlignment. Dot O-R-G, so that you can see this for yourself. You can see this. You can find videos on YouTube of people doing these Christ alignment card readings. It is, it's just, this is just how, look, once you start abandoning scripture and scripture alone as being the authority, every, I mean, there's no end to what's coming into the church. There's no end to what's coming in. So Christ alignment, that, that's what it's called. I'm going to back him up just a little bit more. I'm going to be back here a little bit more. I'm going to go back. You see how many far, how far can we go back? I think that's pretty good. And then I want you to listen to this 
together. Now, Bethel Church, make this very clear, in Redding, California, has issued a statement in regards to basically, hey, we don't, you know, we, we, we they try to distance themselves, but it's it's kind of a very interesting statement. So you, you'll have to draw your own judgment there. I mean, I think there's plenty of things with Bethel Church that we can clearly condemn. Um, how they're connected with this, you can draw your own conclusion, but you need to know about this Christ alignment situation. You need to know what this is, and you need to be on the lookout for it, and you need to be prepared to deal with it. So let's listen to this carefully symbols that are used to give someone a reading about their future, which clearly from Scripture, Deuteronomy 18, this mm-hmm. is divination. You are divining someone's future. That is clearly forbidden and an abomination to God. And I've seen their statements to say that these aren't tarot cards, and technically they're not, but they're using them in the exact same way. And furthermore, the company, Christ Alignment, is not a Christian organization. Correct. The actual company that can manufacture these cards. They talk about terms like Christ spirit, the Christ consciousness, and these are clearly new age terms for Jesus that refers to Jesus much more as a mystical guru or an avatar of a spirit that's been in many different great leaders and spiritual beings throughout time, rather than being the Son of God, the Messiah, and God in the flesh. Even the association that a church, much less one as large and influential as Bethel, would even want any affiliation Mm -hmm. with an organization that does not even acknowledge Jesus Christ for who he truly is. That should be very troubling to Christians. And this is why I had to be so blunt. I try to hesitate to name churches or name people because we're all at different stages in our walk, and we have to really be careful when we're judging. But when we're getting into this territory, it's really troubling. And I've seen videos of the events where they actually are using these Christ Alignment Destiny cards And they're completely New Age pagan events. Right Right, alongside, you have all sorts of occult practices taking place next to the booths where these cards are being used. And so it's deeply troubling. Well, I'm going to play a little clip here. It's going to be Josh Peck and Steve Bancars from their book, The Second Coming of the New Age, talking about all of this. But let me read first what Bethel says on their website. They say there has been some concern about the ministry of Christ alignment and the supposed use of Christian tarot cards and ministering to people at New Age festivals. While the leaders of this ministry are connected with several members to our community, the community being Bethel Church, Redding, California, then they go on to say Christ Alignment is not formally affiliated with Bethel. And then they conclude, we do, however, have a value for what they are seeking to accomplish. Let me just play, it's a two-minute clip here of New Age experts, particularly Steve Bancar's former New Ager, and he's talking here about the seriousness of this Christ Alignment. I read recently on one of the most bizarre headlines I've seen in the church for a long time that there's this kind of Christian tarot card reading thing happening right now. And when I saw that, I thought, oh, okay, it's like this one bizarro church out in Ohio somewhere or something. That's (laughs) not going to happen. That's not going to fly. And then the further I got down the article, I started realizing that's a thing. It's like Mm -hmm. popping up everywhere. What is that? And how have we gotten so misguided that in the church there would be that kind of a practice? And what does it mean? Well, I think real briefly, and I'm going to turn it to Stephen because he wrote a lot about this in the chapter, but I think it's that most Christians, when these new age things happen, they do kind of have that attitude of, well, that's just one crazy church somewhere. It's really not that big of a deal. And then they ignore it and they don't expose the heresy. And that allows it to grow and grow and grow. And it, it goes slowly. It's like the frog in the pot of boiling water. It grows slowly and so slowly that a lot of Christians don't realize it until a couple generations go by. And then our kids are brought up in it. They think that it's normal and it gets more and more normalized. So I, I think that's why it's becoming more prevalent, why all this all this new age stuff in the church is becoming more prevalent and why we had to write this book, but specifically on the, the Christian tarot cards. Oh, yeah. It is more or less facilitated by a pretty wonky ministry. But the problem is that the ministry is condoned and publicly defended by one of the largest ministries in the world, in America, publicly defends and pushes this other ministry. They support them. They're their friends. They believe in their practices. It's called Christ Alignment. Christ Alignment, we mentioned in the book. So you can go on Christ Alignment's website and you can learn about how these cards are more accurate than tarot cards for the readings that they give, right? What do you mean the cards are more accurate? Do you mean Jesus is more accurate? The cards don't have any accuracy in and of themselves Mm -hmm. unless you're a spiritist 
And unless you're a diviner and you believe that cards are somehow linked to archetypes and energies in the universe, in which case then, yeah, cards can have accuracy. But the fact that they say the cards have more accuracy than tarot shows that their words testify they're not deriving their knowledge from the right place. Mm -hmm. And they actually say these cards, we tap into the divine energies of the Christ spirit. What is the divine energies of the Christ spirit? Right. That is so vague. Yeah. Do you mean the Holy Ghost? Do you mean the Holy Spirit who's a person that he tells you things? What's, there is no divine energy of Christ. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. If you just joined me, that was the voice of Steve Bancars, and he was talking about his book, The Second Coming of the New Age. We're not featuring that. What I am featuring this hour, I've gone back to Terry James' book, Lawless, End Times, War Against the Spirit of Antichrist, because my guest on the line from Texas, Ryan Peterson, has contributed a chapter titled End Times Embrace of Evil. And if the name Ryan Peterson is familiar, you've probably read or heard him talk heavily about the Nephilim, and you can learn more at his website, judgmentofthenephilim.com. That's not our topic. I'll have Ryan back another time to talk about that. But I want to talk about this rise of the occult and the New Age and how it's hitting the church, Ryan, only in the interest of time. I'm moving on to something else you write about and that is the Enneagram. It is so popular in today's church, and it works with supposedly nine personality types. Why is this dangerous for a church? What is the potential harm? And I know it encourages those using the Enneagram to focus on their own wants, needs, desires, history, emotions, and fine-tune their own true self. To me, this sounds wildly new age, but it's in the church. The Enneagram, I think, is even more troubling yeah. and disturbing than even the Christ alignment cards because it's much more popular. Yes. As you mentioned, I'm in Texas in the Bible Belt, and there are many what would be considered mainstream evangelical churches that do teachings on the Enneagram, even have shirts. You'll see people from the church on social media with shirts with their Enneagram number on their shirt. They'll say, All right, now. So we got the Christ alignment, which is basically Christian tarot cards, and we have the Enneagram. The Enneagram. Now, I way back when we had a standalone church app before that company got bought out by another company and then the app became useless, okay, I, I played um, an entire sermon or at least two sermons. I may have even posted two sermons from a, a, a big church on the Enneagram. And I'm like, what is this? And that was... I don't know. That was that was a couple of years. I don't even know how many years ago that was. Uh, after 2020, I don't know. So it had, we're in 2021. It had to be 2019, 2008, 2019, maybe. Maybe it was 2019. Uh, but the Enneagram was really starting to take off. And it it is everywhere. It is everywhere. I, do, I Even uh, on the Edify Christian app, on the Edify Christian app, um, I'll get, I'll be searching, just looking for sermons and different things, seeing what's going on within the Christian world. And I'll see sermon series on the Enneagram. And I'm like, wait, what? Well, this is in the church? So we've got Christ alignment. That's basically Christian tarot cards. And we've got the Enneagram. It, and you have to be looking for both of these uh, situations because they're inside the church. They're not, not outside the church. They're inside the church. And you need to be aware. So we're going to go back. I'm going to back this up a little bit again. Um, as I always do. Here we go. So we have some, try to get some context here. Here we go. The Christ alignment cards, because it's much more popular. Yes. As you mentioned, I'm in Texas in the Bible Belt, and there are many what would be considered mainstream evangelical churches that do teachings on the Enneagram, even have shirts. You'll see people from the church on social media with shirts with their Enneagram number on their shirt. They'll say, I'm a six, I'm a seven, I'm a two. And so this has somehow been even more subtle and more accepted than something like a Christ alignment destiny card. And really, it goes back to the same thing. It's the origin. Just like the Christ alignment group is new age, the origins of the Enneagram have absolutely nothing to do with Christianity. And the first person to really write about the Enneagram in a book was a Russian mystic Mm -hmm. named P.D. Opensky. This is back in 1917. He wrote in a book called In Search of the Miraculous. In the book, he credits his mentor, George Gurdjieff, as the creator of the Enneagram. 
the reason why that matters is because once we know that, that we can see Gurdjieff was not only an occultist, he was a disciple of Madame H.P. Blavatsky, Blavatsky, who headed the Theosophical Society, right. who was a Luciferian, and this is the creator of the Enneagram. So the history of this practice goes directly back to a Luciferian, essentially. And so there's an extreme spiritual danger there. And then the teaching itself, when you even see how it's taught in the church, it has nothing to do with the Bible. That's right. For example, one of the biggest conference speakers, a woman named Susan Sabeel, who travels to many churches all year round, preaching and teaching on the Enneagram, it's about understanding yourself, like you said, how you can become your authentic self. There's this notion that we have moved away, that we were made as this almost perfect individual, and somehow as we've left childhood to adulthood, we've moved away from that spiritually. And the Enneagram identifies who we truly were, and it brings us back to that more perfect God-like person. And this is the opposite of Scripture. Psalm 51, David says, we are shaped in iniquity. From the womb we have sinned. The story of the gospel is that we are born sinners, and we are redeemed by a sinless Savior, not that we were once these perfect beings in our birth, and then over time we just forgot who we were. And a number brings us back. You know, it's Christ who redeems. So it's almost replacing Christ and putting the focus on this number in a search that's all about ourselves and not glorifying Christ and letting Jesus live through us. Now, i got to jump in right here. They do make some claims that the origins of the Enneagram go back to, I think, some mystic and Luciferians. Be careful with some of that, some of those claims. Research that for yourself. I've seen, uh, I've seen the Enneagram being attributed to, to the Desert Fa- uh, Fathers, a uh, Kabbalist, uh, other mystics. Uh, Chaldeans, all, a, a lot of ancient groups, but in many cases, a claims for an ancient origin in many cases have not been substantiated, and there seems to be uh, uh, s- s- uh, some dispute about some of those claims. Um, it does uh, appear uh, that it can be traced back to a Russian occultist, and I think they gave his name. Um, I think it's uh, Ospensky, uh, Ospensky, I think is uh, his name, um, but... Um, so there is some questions about the origins of it, um, and 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 I would I would I would warn about getting into some big fight over the origins origins of it. The issue is why is the enneagram being brought into the church? There's nowhere in scripture about the enneagram and doing this to learn your personality type to figure out if you're a one, two, three, four, or five. Are we, we we're supposed to die, and our identity is supposed to be found in Christ? That's what we're supposed to be doing. I'm going to argue about. I'm gonna I'm gonna make an argument here. I think the problem with what's happening, whether it's Christ alignment or the Enneagram or you name 15,000 other things, is because so many people in the church are not finding satisfaction in Christ. They're not finding satisfaction in the Bible. They're not finding satisfaction in prayer. They're not finding satisfaction in studying the scriptures and trying to live out our Christian life and praying for people and witnessing to people. No, they're looking for some other kind of experience to give them some sense of satisfaction. Christ is not satisfying them. And because they came into Christianity seeking some kind of personal satisfaction instead of coming to Christianity in order to die to self. It's, Christianity is not there to give you a personal satisfaction or to fulfill some longing and all of that. Christianity is the call to come and die and follow Christ. You die. You are supposed to, in a sense, disappear. Your identity is in Christ. Your purpose is in Christ. Your pleasure is in Christ. And that's, that's, and I think the church tried to sell Christianity as you come to Jesus and you're going to have, you're going to be, you're going to feel this emotion. You're going to be, you're going to have more purpose, more meaning, more this, more that. And we try to sell it like a, 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 a product, like Christianity was a product to give you personal fulfillment. And then people get within Christianity, they don't feel that quote unquote feelings of personal fulfillment. So we just keep looking for other avenues of spirituality in order to satisfy some longing inside our, of ourselves. I think there's a deep rooted spiritual problem here. And that's why the church is turning to a lot of these issues, the Enneagram and Christ alignment. All right, let's continue. I, I want to hopefully try to get to, uh, through this first segment. So here we go. As you say in the book, the teens of today, and for that matter, all age groups, with this occult preparation, they're going to accept those that aren't raptured with the church, this supernatural man, the Antichrist, who will dazzle the masses with his supernatural abilities. And I think that's the point of 
obviously Terry James' book, but also your chapter is warning against this. And you talk about it, and I'm so glad you did, and I want to talk about it here for just a minute. Folks were only given subject matter within the chapter literally minutes. I think Ryan's written the longest chapter in the book, the most comprehensive. He's tried not to miss anything, and that's hard to do when you're only contributing a chapter to a book and not writing an entire book. But the energy in crystal healing, it's a booming industry. Christians are toying around with it. Supposedly, stones have some sort of metaphysical healing power, which I think many listeners know is nonsense. Nonetheless, it's a billion-dollar industry, which I learned in your chapter. I didn't know it was that popular. The energy crystals, or they call them healing stones, it is super popular, certainly with teens, with millennials, and celebrities have been a big contributor to freely promoting this idea that you can buy these stones that carry either healing properties or channel a certain energy, whether you want to be successful or you want a romance stone. There are all these Mm -hmm. different stones that allow you to channel different spiritual power. And it's a booming industry that, unfortunately, is also infiltrating the church. What might happen, and maybe this is speculation and conjecture here, Ryan, talking to Ryan Peterson, to a Christian practicing energy healing, crystal healing, what's the worst case scenario? When it comes to these spiritual forces, it's like Ephesians 6, who we wrestle against, that if we are opening ourselves, our bodies, our Mm -hmm. homes to the occult, to satanic or demonic forces, we are now giving them access to corrupt us or corrupt our home. You know, the Bible says give no space to the devil. And so I think that any time we're allowing something like energy stones or the Enneagram to come into our faith and what we do every day as a part of our worship, it's that leaven that's going to leaven the whole lump and soon pull us away towards apostasy. Mm -hmm. And like you said, what this is all about, the end game of everything we're talking about from the enemy's perspective is laying the groundwork for the worship of Antichrist, right. who will use occult, satanic, supernatural powers given by the devil. This is all pulling a society to a point that we can accept these things and, right. and embrace them. The more it can infiltrate the church, the more it can pull not only people into apostasy, but think about, say, adults who are doing Enneagrams, what are they teaching their children? Mm -hmm. If you have a quote-unquote Christian household where the parents practice the Enneagram or using energy stones, Christian tarot cards, how is the next generation being raised? They're even further away from anything that's soundly doctrinal. You write about the harlot of Revelation riding the beast decked with precious stones. What is the application you're making to our topic today? We know that the devil is an imitator right down to the Antichrist, who's just a complete satanic mimic of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I think even with stones, when we go back into Scripture, we see that stones matter to God. You know, and I write about the breastplate of the high priest that Aaron was given, and the stones that are specifically described by God, and that they had a supernatural purpose that we see with Joshua and David. They were to use the Urim and the Thummim, which of course means uh, light and perfection, to divine the will of God. And Satan, taking that, has used it for his own evil purposes, this idea that these stones have some purpose with God. And again, we also see in Ezekiel 28, it says that Satan himself was in Eden, the garden of God. It says, every precious stone was thy covering. So even in the angelic realm, this idea of these stones that God has selected having some type of significance on a spiritual sense is biblical. The devil, of course, takes those things and uses it to put the focus on him or for a person who's being deceived by the devil, put the focus on themselves. Because the energy crystal movement is all about getting things for yourself, healing your body or getting the person you want to marry or more money in your career. So it all goes back to you can be as God. Genesis chapter 3, the initial promise that was deception of Adam and Eve is all the same thing, just packaged differently. Talking to Ryan Peterson for the hour, and I'm basing the discussion off the chapter in his book, End Times, Embrace of Evil, because he's contributed to the lawless book that we carry. It's in our online store, Olive Tree Views, views as in viewpoint, olivetreeviews.org, and it has 17 contributors to the book. I'll name the contributors later, and we've talked about the book, and we'll continue to talk about it into the next couple of months, because the contributors have done just an outstanding job of contributing substance. But when I read Ryan's chapter, oh, a couple months ago now, it just jumped out at me as being so relevant to today. And you know, Ryan, there's something that's happened here in the world in the last 50 years, and you do include it in your subject matter. 
And that would be how drugs or pharmacia are playing into our generation. This has only been the last 50 years or so. This has been such a major player. I want to play a real quick sound clip again, of Pastor Billy Crone, talking about how our times have changed so dramatically, and particularly the magic arts, because of pharmacia, that comes right out of Revelation, pharmacy, drugs, etc. Now, of all bizarre things, we have our government legalizing drugs to make a profit and compounding the disaster. We know that people can get saved in the seven-year tribulation, All right, we'll stop right there because I just wanted to focus on those things coming in into the church, the Christ alignment, the Enneagram, and and then these healing stones. Uh, I'm not, I have not seen, and and for those who may know, if you know of some Christian movement where these healing stones are really being pushed, I've clearly missed it. I, 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 I obviously didn't see that. I've seen the Enneagram all over the place and I've heard of the Christ alignment cards in a number of places. So I have, uh, so those two things I definitely know, but here's the idea. If those, those are very specific things that come into the church that you can point to, oh, they're using the Enneagram. Oh, they, they got the Christ alignment cards. Those are tangible things you can see and you can look at. But let me tell you, way before the Christ alignment card shows up, way before an Enneagram shows up, there's something happening in the teaching or something missing in the teaching that sets the stage or lays the framework for these things to be able to come in. And no one raises a concern. No one is bothered. No one sees it because there was something happening in the teaching. There was a lack of doctrine, theology, substance, exegesis. You can name it, name whatever the case may be, thinking, logic, reason, whatever the case may be, and then that comes in. It always start, There's always something that sets the groundwork for these things to come in, but I believe the reason people are so receptive is they have, I, I hate to say this, they've grown bored with Christ. They've grown bored with his word. They're looking for something else because they see church. You go to church to get something for yourself. In other words, to fulfill yourself, to fulfill an emotional need. Maybe you have an emotional need for community. All we need, I need friends. I need community. It's always about people's needs. And we've so emphasized the the fulfilling of needs. But the church is supposed to be made up of individuals who have died to self. They're not there for fulfillment, they're there to equip so they can do the work of ministry and to glorify God. And their, their fulfillment is found in God himself. And I, and I think we've completely missed that valu, va, valuable point. But I just wanted at least for you at least to hear this. Yes, I know they didn't go into great details about these things, Christ alignment cards, um, the Enneagram, or the, the healing stones. I know they didn't go into great detail, but I thought it was at least bring them before you and then you can tell me, oh, yeah, I saw it here. Oh, I saw it there. Yes, I saw it there. And if, if, you, know, if you have links to something, feel free to send them to me, and maybe we'll do a, a greater discussion about them in the future. So um, we'll stop right there. We're at 50 minutes. Again, that's Understanding the Times. You can go uh, listen to their – in fact, I mean, give me a second here. I can pull up their website. I have I have their podcast saved. I have a what's called a feed burner where I have all these RSS feeds. So when I come to the church, I can just go through those RSS feeds and go, oh, I'll grab that program, grab that program, and I can immediately download it and upload it to my uh, studio software. Makes it easy, so I don't actually have to go to websites. Now, when it's something I don't have a loaded into my feed burner, then I have to try to go find their RSS feed and then try to grab the episode. But um, understanding the times. Hang on, understanding, give me one second, understanding the times, here we go, understanding the times, Jan Markell, um, well, let's see, if you, if you do, if you just type in understanding the times, if you, if you just type in understanding the times, the first thing that's going to show up is going to be listen to Jan Markell sermons, understanding the times, it's actually her radio program on oneplace.com, um, let's see here, um, Understanding the Times is also on the Bot Radio Network. Um, Understanding the Times, it's on Apple Podcast. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open Apple Podcast right here. I'm going to open Apple Podcast. Give me one second. It's opening. I'll see how it shows up here. I think if you just do under, uh, search for Understanding the Times in your podcast feed, you should be able to find it. Yes, here it is. Uh, Understanding the Times. If, if you just do a search, you will find it. It is a very... 
It's a very popular uh, podcast. I mean, just to show you, they have a four point. Well, they've got over a thousand uh, star ratings. It looks like they have over four thousand star ratings. That is that uh, that is insane. Let me get here. The Antichrist will be a man okay, hang on. In the <laughs> it's playing. Um, I'm looking here. Um, yeah, they've got. Oh, they've got. Uh, no, they, okay, I'm sorry. They've got 4.7. That's their, their rating. Uh, but they have 1,078 ratings. 1,078 ratings at a 4.7 out of five stars. So, and I don't know how many uh, reviews they have here. But I want you to know, that's why this is so easy to find. Why is it so easy to find? Because of all of those reviews and all of those ratings. I just say that because you cannot even imagine how much you help us when you take a little bit of time to, if you have Apple Podcast, to go give us a rating, a five-star rating, to write a review. I cannot tell you how important that is to go to theologycentral.net and write a review. I, I'm, I, you, you know, um, it's hard work putting podcasts together. It's hard. It's even harder to get people to find you. And the more you can help us find, and, and by giving us those ratings, you get over a thousand ratings, people are going to find it. People are going to find it. We've got, <laughs> what do we got? We got seven. <laughs> We've got eight. We, I don't even think we have 10. Uh, so yeah, so you can see, the, yeah, that, that, that's a big deal. But uh, so go subscribe to it, Understanding the Times. I don't always agree with their eschatology. I don't always agree sometimes with what they have to say. But when they do talk about things going on in the church, a lot of times it can be very informative and uh, helpful for you to see what's happening to the church. And, well, we've got to be on the lookout for it. All right, I'll stop right there. Um, I'll be back uh, on the air here shortly. God bless.